Good evening, everybody, and welcome to NYC Film Green Office Hours. This is an initiative of the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and my name is Shira Gans. I'm the Senior Executive Director of Policy and Programs here at the Mayor's Office. So tonight, I'm really excited to welcome you to our Office Hours series. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our office, our office is the agency in New York City government that supports the creative industries. These industries here in New York City support over 500,000 jobs and $150 billion in economic activity. And we do this primarily, the original uh, reason for our office is to do film permitting for on location shooting. So most of you have probably interacted with our office in one way or another, but we also have developed a suite of programs and initiatives to create access and opportunity across the creative industries, ranging from theater to music to digital games. Um, in addition to supporting permitting, we also try to support sustainable film production in the city. And we do that primarily through our NYC Film Green program, which is designed to both reward um, productions that are already taking steps to reduce their environmental impact and also to create resources for those who wanna take steps to further reduce their impact. So events like this, our office hours, as well as other programs we've created help reach those objectives. And so tonight, without further ado, I'm excited for our topic to talk to producers who are really bringing environmentally sustainable practices into their productions and to have our partners in NYC Film Green Earth Angel to moderate our discussion tonight. So enjoy the discussion and I look forward to seeing you at future office hours. All right. Thank you so much, Shira. And um, thank you and welcome to everybody um, that, that is joining us tonight um, for the Producers Roundtable. This is our third office hours. Um, um, in the last three months, we've had um, discussions on different topics of sustainable production. And um, we're really excited tonight to, to be talking about sustainable production um, from the producer perspective. So um, just a little bit more about the NYC Film Green program, as Shira mentioned, Office Hours is part of the, the engagement and education part of the program, but the um, the kind of the meat of the program is really the, um, the, the tools that we are providing for productions that are filming in New York City. Um, they are free to use. They are on the, um, the MOM website and we'll also have this website up on the, on the slides a little bit later um, so you can really check it out and, and get all the information. But um, the tool is designed to really help um, productions that may not, you know, know how to really start with, you know, trying to green their set. Um, some really very helpful kind of very um, basic and instructions for how to do this and how to tackle different problems regarding waste and energy. And it kind of goes through department by department and um, is a really great tool. There's also other resources um, on the website as well. So we encourage you to, to check that out and let us know if you are interested in trying to, um, you know, use that uh, film green um, certificate program to uh, help uh, integrate sustainable productions on your next project. So um, I am really excited um, to introduce you, um, our panelists for today. Um, we, um, we were lucky to, <laughs> everybody's really busy, but we were lucky enough to get three um, really amazing leaders in sustainable production to join us today to talk about some of the practices that they are um, integrating on their projects. Uh, our first panelist is Stephanie Dawson, and Stephanie is a producer, a line producer, and production manager for narrative, unscripted, and branded content with over 15 years of experience. Her recent credits in New York include Down with the King in 2021, Mayan, Her Love Lover in 2020, uh, Derek Delgado's In and of Itself on Hulu, Great performances on PBS and House Hunters International on HDTV. Stephanie has also worked in live events such as Fashion Week and the Tom Joyner Family Reunion. In 2009, she was introduced to sustainable production on a commercial for a major big box store and then a production with Glass Eye Picks, also implemented sustainability measures on set, sparking synergy between her two. <coughs> 
loves filmmaking and the environment. Stephanie has pushed for eco processes on set wherever possible and is a founding member of the nonprofit Women Independent Producers, co chair of the PGA Green Committee, and climate reality leader. She is currently a producer for the PBS series Great Performances with WNET Group 13. So, welcome, Stephanie. Um, and our next panelist is Damian Resnick, is a 25-year veteran of the film and television industry. Damian came up working primarily in the locations department, including as a location manager for 16 years, and has been producing, production managing and producing for the past seven, working mainly in scripted television and feature films. While an environmental science major in college, Damian became keenly aware of systemic environmental issues within our society and has worked to apply best practices throughout his career in production. He was first part of a full production-wide sustainability effort in 2009 on the film Morning Glory. Uh, Damon has known Emily O'Brien, founder of Earth Angel for over 10 years, when Earth Angel was just her nickname and not her company. Damien is a native New Yorker and lives in Manhattan with his wife, three children, and two dogs. Welcome, Damien. And um, finally, we have um, Caddy Johnston, who has been working in the motion picture industry for over 35 years. She was raised in New York, studied theater at Northwestern University and film at Columbia College, Chicago. After 10 years in the Windy City as a starving artist, Caddy began, began working in the indie commercial world. And many June snowstorms convinced her to move back home to New York, where she worked primarily as a location manager. When her children were small, she was offered the opportunity to budget the short-lived series Help, and she sent, spent several years in accounting before moving up to producer. She has produced works in almost every genre and over 400 hours of television, including 12 years on the series Law & Order. Most recent credits include Netflix Daredevil and the series Limitless and Bull for CBS, and now the series East New York, premiering this Sunday, October 2nd at 10 p.m. on CBS. Welcome, Kadi, and thank you again all for being here. Um, this is going to be a great discussion because I, I love hearing that so many of you have backgrounds from so many different um, departments and can kind of, you know, tell your story from not just the producer perspective, but also from, you know, the kind of the other perspectives, which really, I think, always makes for such a, you know, uh, a, uh, you know, a producer that has had experiences in all these different departments to really understand the kind of the intricacies and the challenges that are unique to all the departments in terms of sustainable production. So welcome everyone. And I think we'll just dive right into some of the questions that we have for you. Um, so we'll start off. Um, how do you describe the current approach or mindset to powering a set? And, you know, it could be for any uh, genre of film, let's take, you know, what you can just choose. Um, you know, what are the main um, areas of, you know, that you focus on for energy, um, you know, for fuel, those types of things. And, um, you know, maybe we'll start, we'll just, we'll start with Stephanie and then we'll just kind of go, go, go through everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it is great to see everybody's uh, different ex um, levels of experience and kind of where they're coming from. So um, interesting in terms of powering and like transportation, energy, all that good stuff. My background is mainly out of, you know, the very small kind of ENG crews, um, and either for branded content or for, um, you know, small documentaries or even shows like House Hunters International, which are done with very small crews. So we are battery power and then, you know, driving a vehicle on, onto a set. Um, but my more recent uh, role with Great Performances, we you know, we we will record an opera or the Philharmonic or um, the most recent production that we did where we were able to bring in Earth Angel was uh, the, the Shakespeare in the Park in Central Park. Um, so th those are more, you know, a television style, uh, a live television style production. Um, it was part of things we'll talk about later on to get them to adhere to the, the sustainability. Uh, we were able to, to move really toward waste management, but energy, they weren't so um, they weren't so able to do so because we needed to power these large trucks and we don't see the kind of um, generators that can produce that level of power at this point. Um, but, you know, and we were, were trying to conserve as much in other areas and we did a lot of waste uh, diversion there. So, you know, generally trying to reduce the number of people that you're bringing on to set, um, you know, reducing the, you know, going to LED lights as opposed to, um, 
you know, the old, old school's tungsten. And then our crews are generally battery powered. So we're really, you know, trying to connect to house power as, as, as often as possible. And then running off batteries um, for a lot of the smaller productions. You're on mute. I think you hit on a lot of uh, the really, um, you know, important and most impactful practices um, regarding energy is, you know, especially with um, batteries, LEDs. And um, so that's great. Um, Damien, what about you? What are, what are, kind of, um, you know, what are your, what is your kind of current approach and kind of some of the main things that you're tackling on your shows? Yeah, I think this aspect of production is one of the hardest ones to tackle because, when you start affecting the amount of power or the type of power that you're bringing to a set, you're potentially affecting the lighting and that gets into the whole creative of what you're doing for your show, which is always a, an issue and so often comes up in, in conflict with maybe best environmental practices because sometimes the creative is, is the creative and you know we're of course uh, all here to support it. And when you start dipping into best environmental practices, if it goes against what a creative head like a cinematographer is going to want to do in terms of lighting, it can be a, a, a bridge that's hard to cross with them successfully. So I, I would say that um, moving towards some of the best technology in lighting that is coming out now, LEDs are getting better and better uh, using those lights as opposed to the older lights, which are much less efficient is a huge help in reducing it. Um, I most recently was on a set where the expectation going in from everyone was that we were going to have to have a generator and run power from there and all of that. And it turned out we were able to use all LED lighting and therefore we had enough power inside the building itself and we saved a generator, which was great for the environment and great for our budget too. So it, it can it can go well. Um, and those tools and the ability to use those tools, I think is a big help in uh, the right direction to do best practices on set. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's always that kind of creative tension there um, that we come across as well um, when we're trying to support shows and, you know, the especially in, in the areas of, of well, in all areas really, but lighting is a big one because as you were mentioning, Stephanie, um, you know, a lot of the te technology that we're kind of looking at now in terms of battery, um, are, they're not really suitable or able to power some of the lights. Um, some of the LEDs are not really, they don't always work for everybody, although there's a lot of variability now and there's a lot of, um, you know, really promising technologies with LEDs. But yeah, I agree, like a big, um, a, a big uh, hurdle to, to go over sometimes. Um, Cody, what about you? What uh, what are you uh, seeing? Well, I I agree with the LED. I I had a stage where we had a huge drop, and we replaced um, the the lights for the drop, cut our electric bill in half, you know, to the tune of like ten thousand dollars a month. It was a lot of money. Um, so, and I have, you know, I try to hire people who are forward thinking. So, in a lot of instances, we're able to do LED lights and. And that cuts our energy usage to a great deal. What I feel is sort of lacking in New York is um, the enormous number of vehicles that are still um, gas powered. I wish there were more down south. They're a little bit better about using solar technology for all the campers and things. We don't do that as well up here. Um, I think it, last year I gave everybody a solar, I have a solar powered charger for my phone that allows me never to have to plug in and I was like oh this is a great gift so it charges enough you just put it park it out in the sun I kind of leave it in my dashboard but so a lot of the little things like that we're having people do but I don't think we've really mastered how to control or how to use sustainable energy in this um, industry yet so I'd love to see more progress there but we definitely have made huge strides with the lighting yeah, that that's great. Well, th this is this topic of you know power has really become one that's sort of risen to the top um, in terms yep. of priority for um, for productions, and um, you know companies like Netflix, you know they've made very bold um, kind of goals that they've set for themselves in terms of reducing carbon. So there's kind of been this shift 
towards, um, you know, really looking at decarbonization, which, you know, is, is great. Um, but there's, there's, there, it's such a broad, you know, there's so many things that we're trying to do with sustainable production um, that may not always be the most um, carbon reducing um, practices. So for example, you know, with waste management, it's a really huge one because there's so many materials and there's so much waste. Um, but in terms from a carbon perspective, it's not always at the top of the list. So, you know, it's kind of like, how do you decide, um, you know, what, what you're going to do? And, um, you know, yeah, so that was, I'm curious, um, I want, you know, you, you kind of all mentioned, you know, some of the people that you, that you bring on, I mean, from a producer perspective, I think it's really um, important. This is one of the reasons that, you know, we thought this would be a great, um, you know, uh, topic to, or, you know, forum to, to have is because um, the producer perspective is, is really important. Um, you know, the, the oftentimes uh, the success of sustainable production strategy and implementation um, is based on, you know, a top-down approach. So, um, you know, uh, it's we find that uh, we're a lot more successful working with productions where we really have buy-in from the producer, the production manager, and some of the you know um, you know more above the line uh, folks that are the big decision makers. So how does that um, you know how do you share that view or or do you find that you know you're looking when you're hiring people for your shows that you're looking for people with that kind of um, you know, experience and people that prioritize sustainability? Well, I'll, I'll sort of take what you said and just add on to it in that as much as I think it's important that producers like us have this as a priority, we're relying on the studios that we're working for and representing to make this a priority for them and to support directly, not just, um, not just verbally and not just sort of on, on paper with a document, but putting in their time and their energy and most oftentimes their money into their show to support best practices. And for me, it's an important conversation to have above me to the studio I'm working for. And if there's other producers and executive producers and people like that, that are the real decision makers on a show uh, to have those conversations early with them, just as much as I'm having the conversations early with crew and department heads that I may be responsible for hiring in terms of our priorities and what we can do and what kind of support we need to do best practices on set. Yeah, that's great. Um, Stephanie, what about do you, what's your approach in terms of kind of team building? Uh, I think it's an interesting question. I think it's great to have all our, our different perspectives because I uh, again, came up through a lot of smaller productions. So a lot of times I am the producer on set. I'm also making sure lunch is ordered. I'm also <laughs> making sure we can order everything. So it's easier for me to have control over what, you know, what the power situation is, what our food situation is, uh, how many people were hiring locally versus how many people were traveling out. So, um, you know, being able to not only have those decisions, be, you know, managing the budget and being able to, to, essentially make sure that we're following through is um, I think a little easier when you have a production that's like less than 10 people. Um, when we, my, my more current, current role, um, you know, we had a crew of, I think almost 200 and it was really important in this instance to have the executive producer and the line producer and the production manager all kind of buy in. So while I'm uh, you know, saying, Hey, I'd love to, you know, have our, you know, WNET is a, is a, um, is an affiliate for PBS generally. So it's, it is one of the largest kind of producers of, of um, television programming in this area, like for, for public television. And so it's a, it's the Titanic. You, you gotta, you gotta get to get, to get that organization to move. It's, it's going to take a little time, but um, I was able, like the, the executive producer totally was able to um, was willing and interested. It was great that earth angel provides like, kind of an all-in-one solution so we just we had a few meetings with them they told us what they can provide we worked on a number and um so 
you know, the, the higher ups are happy with the, with the number and then really having the buy in of the production manager and um, our line producer were key. So like all of the emails that went out to crew like, hey, we're going to this this production is going to be more sustainable. Th we're, we're asking you in your support. These are the these are the measures that we're going to be doing. This is the support that's going to be on set. Um, so really reinforcing that through not just the producers and the executive producers, but also the folks that the the crew interacts with on, on a regular basis the production manager is the person they're going to every time they need something and so, so to have the buy-in of those individuals is also i think really key and really helpful um on, on the larger productions yeah yeah i agree with that um one thing that you know we experience quite regularly and i'm just curious how you know maybe from your perspective Katty, maybe you can take this one what what do you do when you really get that kind of resistance you know, um, it, it kind of happens at all levels and it's, it's not really generally, you know, because people are stubborn or they don't want to do it. Um, but a lot of times it comes down to the budget, which is, you know, something that we're going to dive into in a second year. But, um, but yeah, I'm just wondering how do you, you know, what, what's the conversation when you're, when you're, you know, hearing resistance from either, you know, the studio or even crew members or department heads? You slowly, steadily, persistently put pressure on until you win them over to your side. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, I tend to do, for whatever reason, I tend to do these longer term projects. So um, I kind of go after it for the long haul, but it is with every project you do, you inherit some people, you're hired by some people, and, and uh, then you get to choose your own people. And so for everybody that I speak to, that I hire directly, I bring it up as an issue to find out if they have any issues with it. Um, so it kind of gets laid out on the table there. But when, like the job I'm on now, I inherited 50% of the people mostly from LA and they do a lot of lip service but their I mean their practices are terrible they leave the lights on every night they don't throw trash in the proper um, receptacle and I'm talking about executive producers who are they think that they're really good but they they don't you know so you it's a teaching process no matter what level of resistance you have and uh, usually the first I do series and so first year of a series they don't the studio might say that we're behind you. They might even have a division to help you, but they don't give you the money. And until you actually establish your show and can prove that it saves money, it's very hard to take those steps. Um, I'm fortunate in that I came off of another show where I stole all the recycling bins and, and basically got to reuse them. But I we are we are just starting up and we're far from where I left off on the other show. So, but it is, uh, you know, if you have an executive producer, if you have an actor, if somebody, a key player of influence on your uh, team is behind you, it's a lot easier. So when you have, we have a 400 person staff, so there's a lot yeah. of people we have to cover, but eventually win them over. And then uh, hopefully by the second, if this is a second year, you can hire, um, a really good uh, echo uh, coordinator who starts to inspire people and goes department and by department. And we do, we're doing some of that now, but we don't have the staff that I'm hopeful we'll get. So, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's, you know, we, so we, you know, are trying to support productions in, in any way that we can. Uh, but it's, there are some times where, you know, we're just, unfortunately, the budget doesn't allow for, to have somebody on the crew that's kind of overseeing um, the, you know, the sustainability efforts, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna, I don't want to interrupt, but I, when we had COVID and all those COVID costs, we still have COVID, but they kind of said, this is separate. And I, I sort of feel like that's what they should really do remove it from the package you're going to have x y and z and that mandate in of itself would go a long way towards making it but unfortunately some studios might do that and others do not so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think we're kind of trending to, to seeing more studios um and more productions kind of you know making a point to have somebody that's overseeing that um that you know all because it's it's a lot and even for one person and when we find you know we'll have 400 extras on one day and it's really hard for one person to be you know manning everything else and yeah. on this some holding area with with all those extra bodies so yeah um it's it's there it's challenging in, in a lot of ways but i do think that definitely having somebody um you know as part of their job uh 
to, to oversee, even though it, we definitely 100% rely on other crew, right? I mean, it's everybody's got lots of waste and it's really only a couple people that are dealing with everybody's waste, every, everybody's materials, all the, you know, the energy. Um, so it's, it's, it's so much about collaborating with all the departments to, to kind of support and help, um, you know, implement uh, the strategy. So um, yeah. So um, anyone else have any other, you know, kind of tips or advice about when, you know, we, you are experiencing any kind of pushback or resistance? I think another thing I would add is, um, especially on like features and television shows, if you can get the coordinator, the department coordinator on your side, if they can be that at, at the advocate, a lot of times they can alleviate some of the challenges from either production or you know other departments that are trying to implement sustainable practices because they're buying the materials they're you know all the orders are coming into them and they're disseminating the things so you know and, and depending on what your office space is they're in the same office so a lot of times you can uh, really kind of pull the coordinators together if you got them on your side uh, you you can especially when it, when it comes to um, when it comes to the material reduction and the waste management those really can be some great advocates. Um, and I, when I visited Kati's last show, I, I also loved how they, they had built a competition against the different departments. So it was, you know, and it, Kati, you can speak more to it, but I, I, I tell everybody that, the example. People love contests. They love even like little party favors. And they also love to be competitive. Like, you know, this department came up with a new innovative thing to do, or we, this department diverted more waste than that last department. And, and especially, it, you know, when you're on a, a long running show, you can build up you know, uh, people who um, in a practice of doing that. But I think, you know, getting an advocate, even if you don't have an eco manager necessarily, if you can get the coordinators of the department or, you know, the ADs, folks that that are looked to as resources on the crew that are, are that are already invested kind of personally, I think that helps. And then comp everybody likes a, a good competition. Yeah, it's it's funny and kind of crazy how competitive uh, people get with those because we we actually encourage that type of um, you know like a green champion competition because it's really a great and fun way to engage the crew. Um, so and so, Kadi, you've done that on your. On oh your yeah, team. well, that's you know basically I've got some. It's amazing to me on this one how many people are really not recyclers and don't really understand the waste concept. Even younger people, I'm like, really? You don't do this at home? Um, yeah. But we've got some, the people that came from my prior show already have their habits in place. Um, and, you know, what happened, I think that job, somebody who is the echo coordinator, and we always, like, we didn't leave them alone with 400 people. We would always staff up. Um, when we'd have big days like that, but someone who can bring fun to it and make it be a challenge because every department has their own sort of specific needs. And it's truly amazing what, you know, what can happen when people put their minds to it. And the competition is really pretty good. <laughs> so it was uh, one week, the whole office was uh, emptying out all the, uh, the, we had those caring things, right? And so you can actually recycle them if you clean them. They cleaned yeah. them all out so that we could recycle them. So I guess they won that week, whatever that was, the echo challenge, but yeah. yeah. You can make it a game and it's more fun that way. Oh yeah, definitely. I've been, um, we've, we've been really creative on, on some shows, you know, having art departments, like, you know, make some sort of like, you know, <laughs> you know scepter or something that, that that they win and it's hilarious how comp competitive they get you know they they don't you know sometimes it comes along with a prize they you know a, a gift card to a zero waste store or something like that but it's almost like they don't care about that they want the you know green scepter of, of the, to the champ you know to be the champion of the week it's it's pretty fun yeah bragging rights can be quite the motivator that's right yeah <laughs> um so I kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Did you have something else? Oh, sorry, okay. Um, so I was just, I'm, I'm curious now because, you know, probably the biggest um, challenge I would say whenever we're working with a show really of any size is um, like I was saying before, people really wanna do the right thing, but it's, it's, um, it's very difficult because they have not built sustainability costs 
um, into their budgets. So I'm wondering if you guys have any, you know, information that you are, you know, advice or, or practices that you can share with us about, you know, how do we, how do we pay for sustainability? Damien, well, you want to take one? <laughs> I'd say, you know, early on in prep, you have your conversation with the studio, whoever you're working for about, you know, what you'd like to do, the importance of it. You find out if they have practices in place and what those are. And early on, on the on the type of productions that I work on, there's a lot of back and forth with the budget when you're in prep and you're working things out. So to make sustainability part of that and to be able to get, you know, a, a line item in budgetary terms to be able to have for sustainability or an eco coordinator or a company like Earth Angel that can help facilitate best practices um, on set and and make them into reality is ideal. Um, and I think that's the conversation you have early on with the studio. As you go, I, what I'll say, and I'll, I often come back to this phrase, my instincts as a producer go right in line and hand in hand with my instincts as somebody who wants to, you know, do as good for the environment as I can. And that's, I, I don't like waste. I don't like waste as a producer. I don't like waste as a person. And that's in my personal life uh, as well as my work life. So I try to kind of go with all the crew I'm working with, and this includes our, our director, um, that I, I want to give us what we need, but I don't want to give more. And I don't want to have things just to have things. I don't want to have every option on the table just in case somebody has a whim or changes their mind. I want to kind of know what we want and be able to get that use that as efficiently as we possibly can and move on to the next. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of practice, that, that mantra that I keep in mind, I feel like it helps me be a better producer and I feel like it helps me be a, a better environmental steward at my work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is really kind of the, um, you know, number one principle of of you know waste management is really starting with reducing right like the the best way to really um reduce your impacts for in terms of waste overall is to reduce what you're purchasing in the first place because that means you just have that much less stuff to deal with at the end so um you know and what Cody said too earlier um in terms of kind of it's a work in progress with the studio you're working for and the people you're you're working with and I think there are ways as you go to demonstrate that okay we don't have money maybe to hire a eco coordinator or a company but there are environmentally responsible things that we can do that'll also save money and that's a that's a win-win for everybody and, and oftentimes it doesn't take a lot uh, more effort it just takes a little more consciousness to be able to do it and I think I think that's an important thing too to just keep the conversation going with people and make it uh, more like of a front of a brain item for everyone uh, and not something that just becomes uh, a, a desire that doesn't get implemented into reality. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you know, I, we, we've been thinking a lot so much about, um, you know, how, how can we probably one of the best ways that we can, you know, help uh, productions with implementing sustainability is, is really making it, um, you know, having a better understanding of what, what these costs are. Like really, is there, is there a premium for being sustainable on a show? So, you know, I think right now the answer is probably yes. <laughs> um you know that you know if you're going to hire somebody an extra body to to be the eco person that is a cost right so but there's other things like you were just mentioning Damian and maybe you know uh, uh, Cuddy or, or Stephanie you can help us with some examples of you know where we can pro possibly see some savings um hey, yeah. one of the big things is the loss of if you can do digital distribution of paperwork you can mm. cut not that there's some paper you really do need. And I found sometimes with accounting, it kind of backfires, but you can, by going digital distribution, we cut costs enormously. So everybody gets everything that way and only gets printed when requested or needed. The other thing you can do is take away their trash cans. We took away everyone's trash can and put the recycling bins. They're not that far away. We, what an uproar that was, but now everybody gets up and they have to go to the bin 
and that makes them decide where to put it. And so things that might be, you know, paper will go on paper and recycling will go on recycling. That made a huge difference. Those are really simple things you can do that that save you time and money. And if you're whatever your um, carter is, whatever your trash disposal is, if you can get them, if they're a person that will recycle, then you're you're golden. So, yeah, definitely. And um, just a, a couple of things to add, like you know, when I think about the, you know one one of the bane of my existence is those single use water bottles. And you know, in, in New York and a lot of states, it, it's a there's a deposit on the bottle, so you're buying the bottles. Plus, there's a deposit. A lot of times, I don't get drunk all the way so they're half used or partially used or strewn all over the set if you were to just a five gallon dispenser and people bring their own water that's a tremendous savings like you can provide you know you can you can have more people drinking water less water is wasted all those things and that that's a it feels small but over the course of buying you know 20 25 dollar you know packs of water we buy flats of water on on lots of big shows so um you know that that is a a very real cost savings that that I think people show up. And then the other, I think another kind of goodwill thing is not create like not having so much food. Like, do we need to have every possible delectable, you know, option in terms of food? We have the, like we have these massive buffets, and I'm like, is this a cruise ship? Like, why we have <laughs> so many different kinds of food? If we just provide, and again, I you know, from in the indie film world, we, we get one thing. Like there, there's not like a, a dessert spread and a salad spread there's like everybody's getting the one thing uh, so so you know, keeping those um those kind of possibilities down now of course you know you have to deal with allergies and, and sp specific dietary requirements but having that you know is, is a big reduction another thing is um again working from smaller projects instead of having trailers and trucks and things like we're we're you know we're loading people's dressing rooms and, and offices into the location so we're not getting you know external trailers we're yeah. utilizing the space and sometimes doubling up the space if, if somebody's there in the morning and then once they're out we clear it out and then we, we use that same um space for a dressing room or or you know a resting space so really thinking about what you need reducing your footprint reducing your um the overall requests um and and being intentional about it and i think it's not really a cost savings but i think it's a a political and and a emotional um savings of your crew when you can say that you're donating the food the food that we didn't eat or we're donating you know clothing or things to people in need like those are also things that i think go a long way to you know it's it's kind of a, a morale boost for your crew which helps with, with productivity so it's you don't have a dollar figure for it but you when people feel good about what they're doing they feel good about the job that they're doing and the fact that they're um you know doing some good in the world i think also kind of helps contribute to productivity which i think also uh, can reflect on the bottom line even though it's not as easy to quantify yeah Absolutely. I mean, it's it's so interesting because all these things that you guys are saying, you know, single reducing single use water bottles, you know, buying in bulk, basically, there's even there's a definite cost savings that we can see there as well as, you know, you know, kind of digitizing our workflow and our work process and, you know, reducing on that those paper purchases as well as more accurate head counts so that we're not over making the food because I've been, you know, I, I, I was a, you know, eco PA at one point and, and um, you know, there was just tons of leftover food. You know, I mean, I guess, you know, you don't want to run out of food, but I think with a little bit more kind of planning and, and more accurate counting later that you can actually have, you know, not be making way too much food but again at the same time if if you do have these leftovers i think you know on almost any production now that we're working with if we do have leftovers we have some sort of resource um we definitely have in new york city we work with rock and roll um rock can roll <laughs> um and in la we have other you know other um organizations that we work with that pick up that food and donate it and um you know it's it's amazing what you're bringing like you know you know, filet mignon to like this, this resident and then, you know, residential place. And they're just so can't, they can't believe it. You know, these full cakes that haven't been touched or anything. So it's, it's a really um, amazing way to, to, you know, develop community ties and, 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 you know, the organizations that we've worked with have been so, so thankful and grateful for, for those kinds of uh, donations. Um, yeah. So, um, 
just curious, I mean, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, impacts, the biggest impact um, in terms of carbon on a production is really um, fuel. So we've got fuel that we're using in our generators to power sets and, you know, circus and trailers. And then we also have, you know, the fuel that we use in our vehicles and our trucks and, you know, the, the air travel. So wondering if you guys have any kind of approaches to fuel reduction, um, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, some of the, um, the, the studios, particularly Netflix, I would say, are really focusing on those types of strategies for carbon reduction in terms, you know, trying to get their fuel use down. So do you have any experience with that, either from, you know, implementing anything or seeing any savings from, you know, doing battery powered versus or, or, or EVs versus, you know, paying for all that fuel? I mean, I'll just say it's one of the hardest things to do in my experience because you need transportation to do what we do. Um, yeah. And this will, again, go back to something that I'll just, I try to use wherever I go and try to think about it in this way. If you can't do a lot, if you can't do it all, do what you can. And that's a big thing for, for me. Um, we're not going to get rid of trailers anytime soon. We're not going to get rid of 18K lights anytime soon that require a ton of power to light up streets at night. It's not going to happen. So taking that as just a reality, what can we do? We can get hybrids or electric cars. That helps. Um, we can tie into locations whenever possible and try to encourage that wherever we go. We can do that. We can certainly make sure that we're turning off lights, that we're making sure that our vehicles are not idling when they're not doing anything. We certainly can make sure that we are carpooling and transporting people together as opposed to exclusively without, uh, without care of how many vehicles then we have. Those decisions, which again, you do need some studio support to that because if you are stuck with an actor that has exclusive transportation just for themselves, and that's the studio deal that they made, you're gonna be stuck with having an extra vehicle just for that person. It's not ideal, but that's what you'll be with. And yeah. you do the best you can. Maybe, you maybe, that, can that, be <laughs> maybe that? that can be an EV. Maybe that one can be an EV. Well, exactly. But at <laughs> least if you get a hybrid car, you're doing what you can in the situation that you've been handed. And that's something that I'll keep going back to in that regard. And, and that's my attitude towards fuel reduction on set. You do everything you can to do the best you can in the situation that you're that you're handed and you keep having the larger conversations about how to make it better in the long run and how to make it better for next time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we did something that um, I have a budget issues on the show I have now and they weren't going to give me hybrids, but I actually put on paper how it saved us money. So they, we were able to get some hybrids vehicles, um, but we're we're, the show is called East New York, and we're based in Bushwick, not very far from East New York. And so we decided um, to make the decision to not actually to always use this as, as much as we can as the home base, which means we're not driving vehicles at all or very minimally. Um, it's been a little bit challenging, but uh, but I think one of the things you can do also is look at maybe your schedule has in it some opportunities to not bring everything all the time or to actually reduce the footprint where you're going. And so I think we're looking at that here because it's one of the things we can do that they'll give us credit for because it allows us to lay off vehicles. So, uh, but it's yeah. a cool difference, you know, if you're not driving places. And, and the yeah. other thing we do is we text out on the subway with some frequency, so. And, and it goes back to what we talked about before that budget and schedule efficiency is very oftentimes environmental efficiency too so yeah. one can help each other hand in hand and they're not uh, always opposed to oh if you do in best practices it, it therefore is is more expensive that's not necessarily true it's not it's not true in a lot of cases um and one other thing i'll just say and going back to my point of you sort of do all the all the little things you can there's certain things that i bring on a show even if i'm not working with a studio that's particularly putting their money where their mouth is in terms of best practices, or I don't have the resources to bring on an EO company or PA, there's still certain things that I will do on my shows right. mandatorily. It's not having disposable products in our office. It's not ordering from places that 
send packets of silverware every time you order food. If they don't listen to us and say, we don't want that stuff and sending it anyway, I tell my office, don't order from that place in New York City. There's hundreds of places we can order from. Um, we don't have bottled water on set. I've switched a few years ago to only having aluminum canned water you know, and or refillable bottles for people to bring their own bottles and fill them up. And we try to donate our leftover food whenever possible. Those things at a minimum to me, I think you can do doesn't really take any more effort and it helps. And if that's the only thing you can do on a show, it's still something and I'd encourage everybody to do it. And just to piggyback on that also, you know, opt in, opt out only of, of digital distribution of, of your scripts, your, your, your schedules and all those things. And for those people who do want them only double-sided, like we just make it so the copier can only print double-sided and it's a big, you know, it's a, it's a harder thing to try to make it um, single-sided. But I, I think the other, thing as Damien mentioned like there's so everything contributes to to the problem so if you can do one thing one thing this time that that helps I think sometimes with the climate anxiety it's like oh there's so much but if I can do one thing this time and then that becomes a, a best you know that becomes a practice that I kind of bring in and then I'll do a different thing the second time or you know, another thing that I try to do is also model the behavior. So uh, yeah. Katya and I, we we kind of traded um, suggestions around like, we, you know, we already have the, the bottle, like I have my own bottle, but I also have my own silverware that I bring with me. And I always bring, you know, break out that silverware and people are like, oh, that's interesting. You have your own silverware, like presenting that those options to individuals, I think helps engender that I'm not just putting this on you. This is something yeah. that I'm trying to live as well. So um, kind of sharing that perspective, I, I, I hope is, is making a difference across the, across the set. But uh, also the technology is getting better. I've, I've worked on some reality shows that we had a lot of vehicles and back in the day, there weren't as many um, hybrids. So now, you know, seeing the opportunity with more hybrids, also some of the vendors that we go out to, I think, and you know, that's another point is if your vendor, if your car vendor cannot provide enough hybrids and say, well, you need to find more hybrids or I'm going to go somewhere else. And that hopefully will encourage them to increase their fleet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've seen such a huge uptake just in the last few years with shows that are renting EVs and hybrids, because as you said, Katty, like if you look at the numbers, right, you look at how much it costs to rent an ICE vehicle, versus a hybrid or an EV, it's, there's a little bit of a premium for the, you know, the more efficient cars, but then you throw on fuel costs and it's like a no brainer. I mean, you are real, especially today you're saving You're it's obvious how much you can save in that regard. But the challenge I think is really access to the vehicles. Um, because ev I think everywhere in, in the world, <laughs> uh, they, there's a shortage of EVs and hybrids. Everybody's wanting to you know, to purchase them and, and, um, you know, the, the rental companies have back orders and, you know, they're, we're, we're trying, but again, it's that like technology and, and innovation and, um, supply keeping up with what we really want to do. Um, we have great intentions, but sometimes we just can't do it. Um, but this is, this is all so, so great. I just, um, <clears throat> I want to open it up, um, for a couple questions. Um, sorry, my, <laughs> My my whole computer is frozen, so I can't control anything. So, Anna Laura, if there are any questions, um, you can just go ahead and and kind of interrupt me because I I literally can't control anything on my computer right now. So, um, if you uh, if you if I think you said um, there there is a question. Um, yes, yes, there is. Okay, um, and it's from Nan. So okay. I'm going to allow Nan to speak right now. And they can pose their question. It was more of a comment, but oh, okay. Uh, the floor is all yours, man. Am I unmuted at this moment? Yes, you are. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi, Dame. Um, it really wasn't a question, but I did a couple things. We gave more money if you had to drive outside the zone from your 30 miles. They gave the studio allowed us to give a little more money to people who had electric cars hmm, for rentals, for their rentals. Like mm -hmm. if they got 125 a week, we were able to give people with EVs 175 a week. It helped people go get electric vehicles um, if they worked a lot. The other thing, um, had a rented garbage truck on a show because lunch garbage is usually taken away by the caterers. Unfortunately, it falls on location departments in New York a lot. And at the end of location shooting, there's still a ton of garbage. And we mm -hmm. 
rented, we call it the pumpkin. It was an orange truck and it would last about three days because it would squish the garbage and it would go around to the locations that we shot at and we could just throw the bags in there. And then at the end of the week or twice a week, dump the garbage truck to find the place that would take it. Um, the other thing I did recently was vending machines that took no money. And in the vending machines, I put mini sodas and mini waters mm. and snacks. So you pushed E G four and you got your potato chips. The amount that people didn't bother when they weren't all just laying out there was amazing. You know, mm. we just assigned one of set PAs, like when you see it getting low, just go refill it. Here's where all the stash is. And people didn't bother. There were garbage cans after the cans and the garbage. They didn't bother taking as much. And we didn't have to have coolers with ice all over the place and drag them around. They On stage, especially, they walked to the vending machines. It saved a lot of food money and cans. Wow, that's great. I, I you know, I just love hearing about, um, you know, these kind of creative solutions. Um, uh, you know, we I've seen a lot of really amazing things, um, you know, all the way from, you know, doing something like that. I've never seen actually a, a vending machine, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, we did it for COVID also. Yeah. So people weren't mm -hmm. touching yeah. everything. We didn't have, an, have to have an extra craft service person. We we're like, yeah. no, nope, just got a vending machine. And then we had gloves and hand sanitizer right there and they could get whatever they wanted. Um. <laughs> People love that too. They didn't have to put money in. Right. right. It was free. <laughs> you just want to see if it works. <laughs> free food. Yeah. It was good. It worked. Yeah. And I think but, it's interesting the, the psychology of it. I mean, just like taking away a garbage can. If the, if the garbage can is just right there, it's very uh -huh. easy to just throw something in there. Um, I also think relabeling the garbage cans as landfill. <laughs> Is, is another thing that helps, you know, yeah. change behavior. Like I, if I'm just going to throw something in a can, I don't know what happens to it, but, but I know it's going to the landfill that makes me take a pause. So I think it's really the, the vending machines interesting because if it's not, if it's laying out there, people tend to take, and then they, they may not um, either eat it or they, they'll, you know, they'll kind of hoard it. But if yeah. it's something you have to physically like go and get each individual one, it's like a self-selection thing. Like, I don't really need that thing. So um, I don't feel like, like walking there right now. Yeah. Yeah. So some of those behaviors, some of those like almost like psychological um, triggers, if so, just like the catering, if it's plentiful and there's so much salad out there, I'll have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But if it's a smaller um, kind of offering, I'm going to focus on what I'm buying. So some of those things I think are also helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, I don't know if we, we had any comments or, or questions. I didn't see any in the chat, but I, I did want to ask, um, you know, uh, just in particular to, you know, working in New York City, are there any, um, you know, any kind of resources or hacks or tricks or, or, you know, where can we tie in anything particular to shooting in New York that we can, you know, share with others <laughs> or, or sustainability secrets? Hire Earth Angel, they're great. They'll help uh. you with it. <laughs> um, they're, uh, no, the, uh, yeah, look, it's challenging. New York is challenging in about every way you can think of as, as most people probably on this panel know. Um, but there are resources out there. There are resources that will take your leftover food. There are resources that will take your leftover set dressing in props and set walls. And it's always better to give them and pass them on to be reused and try to find ways for you to reuse things than just doing things from scratch and buying more stuff. It's, it's a big pet peeve of mine uh, in general. And I think through the film office, uh, through Earth Angel and through colleagues such as us, uh, there are resources out there just to help acquire uh, lightly used stuff and to give away the stuff that has been used so that people um, can use it again, uh, whether they're you know just colleagues or people who are less fortunate that could really use the free stuff. Um, I think uh, just ask for uh, colleagues and, and resources that you find here on the panel for, for help to find those and they're out there. I was also gonna say, go local. Um, and of course, it depends on what your you know project is and how long it is. But wherever you're filming, see if what you can find there. You know, recycle locally. Um, if you can also find a 
if you can get your crew to compost, if you can find a local farm that will take all the compost, um, that really works well. Or if you're a carter, you're a um, trash hauler, we'll do it for you. That will work too. But um, but we found like a, a giving away wardrobe to like the local daycare center or we actually opened up on the street. I just got rid of a bunch of stuff at the show. We opened up, you know, on the street and we said, fill a bag for 20 bucks. And then we got all the local agencies to come over. And so we got rid of it all in basically two days. It was great. So, you know, mm -hmm. use, use your environment. Um, yeah. And I just, I would echo the, the go local in so many ways. <clears throat> when, when I'm working on like super indies, we, we don't have the budget to, to bring all the entire department to wherever I do, you know, some of the films I've done that are upstate or in the Berkshires or like in the local areas, there's a tendency to want to bring everyone with you. But uh, especially the, the um, one of the last films I did in the Berkshires, it's like we don't have money to be bringing people up from New York City and putting them up in, up in the Berkshires, which is a, you know, a vacation destination. So we had to find like Airbnb for people it's like hire locally, like there's there are people right then and there you can if you we're going to be taking from the local community, let's let's um let's you know use our imaginations we, we had a lot of people who who were from shakespeare and company that worked on that film so so like art department was was pretty much provided there you know actors there, there's there's a lot there's a rich um kind of bed of creativity in terms of performance um art um you know folks in front of and behind the camera there's also artisans like you know you, you could buy off of Amazon and have it shipped, or you can go to a local, you know, art store and have them, you know, provide the artwork for the, you know, the set dressing or, or you know, buy lo from local um, creators. So I think the local piece is another way it reduces your transportation, reduces your energy, you know, and you, you're being a good steward for the community that you're that you're working in. Um, and it's kind of again to what Damien was saying, like it's also um, cost saving measures. A lot of times are also inherently um, sustainable. They're inherently more uh, or less damaging because we can't buy all these things. We're focusing and we're being very intentional about what we're selecting. So, you know, each one of those decisions can help you both save money and be more sustainable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, that, you know, that local piece in, in so many ways um, is it, there, there's so much connected to that in terms from a sustainability perspective, not only from like a sourcing perspective, but also like you were saying, like the transportation and the shipping of everything. I mean, I just went to this um, this uh, really cool uh, uh, talk the other day um, about uh, sustainability and and locations and how you know what we can all do, um, you know, there in in just from that kind of viewpoint. And, um, you know, a lot of location managers were just saying, you know, just being more local, you know, choosing more local um, places and also reducing the number of locations as much as we can. Um, you know, you take out one location and it's unbelievable the amount that you can actually reduce in terms of carbon and materials and, and everything. So that's, you know, that's really um, a, a big, you know, a big thing that we can um, start to think about. Um, and I love the idea of scouting on the subway. That's cool. We don't have a subway. I'm in Vancouver. We don't, well, we have, so we have one, but I don't think it'd be very <laughs> convenient to, to do scouting on the subway here. Um, but anyways, I think we're we're just about at time. I don't know if you guys had a few more minutes. I would love to just ask one more question that I was curious about, um, and um, and if you, if is it okay? Do you guys have like a couple minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, if you if you could have you know a magic wand and you can just you know have one thing that would maybe kind of really push um or, you know the, the sustainable production movement forward um what 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 would that be i have a lot of things that i can think of but i i, I, <laughs> I would curious. like From producer perspective like what what would that i be? would like every studio on every budget that i inherit for a show i work on to have a, an environmental stewardship line item that we can use to, to hire a, a company and, and or a person uh, to really implement best practices where that is that person's job, mm -hmm. period, end of story. That's their only job uh, to be able to do it. So that becomes uh, the leader 
and the one that implements best practices on, on set, because I think everyone on the ground wants to do the right thing, but it's very hard to when your everyday job has the pressure of delivering what you're hired to do in your job. Um, and unfortunately, I think environmental best practices um, gets too often pushed to the side where if there was somebody there to show them how to do it and to take some of that pressure off them on making the best decisions possible, that doesn't get in the way of the time and energy they need to focus on their actual job. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd like. Awesome. Stephanie Boy, or Teddy. You're, you're absolutely right. That's that's the thing to do. I was actually thinking that if everything could be solar powered and no more fuel, <laughs> I was going higher than that. Um, mm -hmm. But if we could eliminate all the, the travel and all of the uh, burning of fossil fuel that we do and lessen our electrical needs, or at least make them from that nuclear reactor 93 million miles away instead of from... Um, that's what I wish would happen. I wish there were more because the you know the U.S. unlike Canada, we don't have funding sources that um, support our um, industry. So it's either coming from a studio or it's coming from in, in, a high net worth individual, like these institutions, these folks who are pretty much steeped in the way things are. So you know, very capitalist, very you know, bottom line kind of vision. And I I would I would love to provide more financial resources for productions of any size or you know or some of the the tax incentives or any kind of program to offset this cost because you know I, i'd love um for the technology to be there i'd love for for there to be mandates or um you know eco stewards in each budget um i also think that we're not, I, I don't think we're gonna change this whole bottom line mindset, uh, you know, anytime soon. So providing um, opportunities either at the, at the government level, at the um, film festivals, at, uh, you know, studios, at um, in, when it terms, in terms of high net worth individuals, can there be some kind of like equivalent of the 181 that if your production is sustainable, you get an, a, an additional kickback or some additional funding. Um, I think if, if something like that could exist, because, uh, you know, again, we're so capitalist mindset, anything that can contribute to the bottom line in terms of getting money back or, or savings, I think will will also um, be kind of a boon to get us to, to make the changes we know we need to make. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we are starting to see that a little bit, you know, here and there, we're starting to see more incentives beyond just the labor incentives um, in terms of, you know, making efforts to reduce fuel um, and be greener. Um, and, you know, hopefully maybe in New York City, we can have that one day. Um, but um, yeah, so this is kind of, this has been amazing. Um, and I, I really appreciate all the really amazing insights that that you've shared with us. And it's it's really inspirational. And, and hopefully, you know, people um, that are here or, you know, that, that may be, you know, more like the independent uh, filmmaker or not having as, as many resources as some of the, you know, other bigger productions um, can, you know, can take away some of these, these ideas that you guys have shared with us. Um, and as well, you know, really look to the New York City Film Green Program for that guidance. Um, also, they, you know, beyond the um, kind of the, the helpful kind of practices, we also have obviously the office hours, but we also, you know, have some resources in terms of um, like some of the places that you guys were talking about, um, you know, where you can source things, where you can bring things, um, you know, so who some of the, the leaders are in the New York City area that are um, supporting sustainable production, like Shatter Prism, who's, um, you know, renting the battery power generators. Um, so that, you know, that's also a resource through New York City Film Green as well. So um, we're, we now will kind of transition to the office hours portion of, um, of you know, the office hours. Um, but I, I just wanted to see if there are any other questions or if you guys wanna have any last parting, uh, share any last parting um, wisdom with us or, or insights. I would just say uh, everyone should do whatever they can. It's all, it's all for the good and it all helps. Yeah. Yes, 
hundred percent, you know, we're not, we're not going to get it perfectly. And, um, we all, you know, we're, we're there's there. I I went to a seminar today about um, you know kind of reporting on greenhouse gas emissions, and one of the biggest takeaways from that was they were saying, you know, yeah, it's really important to track and to measure. But we have to simultaneously be taking action because these things really need to be done today. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's really important for us to, to really be taking action in in all industries and not just in our work, but also you know in our personal lives. Like I, I know all of you are, which is was just so inspiring. Um, so yeah, I agree hundred percent. You know, we're we're not going to be able to do everything, but let's everybody do something. <laughs> Absolutely. And one, one more thing is also, we can also bring these stories on screen, because I think if we um, can share the, the what is really a shared experience of climate change right now, like we, I think we, we, we keep making these projects and act as if climate change doesn't exist. So if we can also bring some of that content into the stories themselves, um, I think that can also go a long way because you can, you can affect your you know, five person crew, your 100 person crew, your 400 person crew. But if your story includes um, some level of climate storytelling, you're you're going to affect millions of people. You're affecting all the viewers as well to maybe encourage them to, you know, find out what what the source of some of their food is. Uh, find out the energy where their energy is coming from. Find find out all these kinds of things. So you know, do what you can and learn as much. Thank you for everybody who came. Thank you for the mayor's office for hosting and Earth Angel and um, everyone. And yeah, just. I think um, also if you can add a little climate reality into your stories in the the shows that you're making, I think that can also make a difference. That's that that's a future office hours, Stephanie. <laughs> so maybe we we can invite you back for that one. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, if uh, if there was nothing nothing else, no other questions, um, uh, I think we can transition. And obviously, you're you're all welcome to stay um, for the office hours part, just to see if we we have any other questions. And um, and uh, you know, uh, we don't. Um, let's see. Do we have any other? Uh, I think Anna Laura, did you want to also talk about the the next? Um, the next office hours and maybe give a little bit of a summary and the data on that. Yeah. Uh, first, Caddy, Stephanie, uh, Damian, thank you so much for your participation. Your your words, your insights were super valuable and I'm sure everyone participating or everyone listening in is scribbling away, furiously writing notes um, and storing all of that uh, valuable insight. Um, our next, office hours event will be on November 9th. Uh, we just skipped over the midterm elections, uh, so it'll be November 9th, and it'll be on the sustainable costume department. We'll be chatting about sustainable textiles. We'll be chatting about uh, sourcing secondhand, um, how to recycle scrap fabrics, um, and then also designing with circularity in mind, uh, looking at life cycle analysis of, of fabrics and how imperative it is for uh, the costume department to start looking at these concepts. So yeah, we'll have a whole other pan panel of really insightful people who have worked in this department um, uh, or are working on the back end to recycle the fabrics. Uh, so definitely join us on November 9th, also from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be sending out information and registration links for that as well uh, and look out for um, our posts on our social media at Earth Angel. Um, but yes, that is our next event. Yeah, yeah. And also for, um, you know, if you have anyone else uh, or you guys know anyone else, you know, either, um, you know, our panelists or our attendees that are interested in in um, hearing what we had to, you know, share today, um, the mayor's office does, uh, you know, we did record this. So um, the, this will be, on the MOM website, the NYC Film Green, um, so that you can go back and share it with with you know people that may have missed it. Um, so that's that's another great resource um, through the through NYC Film Green. Um, all right. So if there was nothing else, um, I would love to move to office hours and see if we have any questions. Again, NLR, I'm sorry, I I cannot I can't access anything because my I'm 
my <laughs> I can't my screen is completely frozen. <laughs> um, That's all right. Um, we haven't had any questions posted to the chat. Okay. Um, please speak up. Feel free to post something or just raise your hand, and we can um, let you speak um, now. Uh, and if you have any questions for either the panelists um, or for Earth Angel, it can be about anything regarding sustainable production. Well, if 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 we don't have any, or we can, you can just interrupt me. I, do we? I I can't even see. Do we still have all the panelists here? <laughs> so yes. <sorry. laughs> Thank you. Well, I just had a cur I was curious if, um, it, you know, Stephanie, you mentioned before, um, you know, kind of some of the fuel reduction strategies, in, including, um, you know, EVs and and uh, battery powered generators, but you also mentioned tie-ins. So this has become kind of something that we're really seeing a lot of other jurisdictions talking about. And, um, you know, they've even, you know, they've been talking about it, the mayor's office as well, like the possibility of that and, and the reality of that. But do you, do you or any of you have experience with um, using tie-ins at, at different locations? Yeah, I'm gonna defer to Kati on that one. <laughs> want to say like when I first started in this industry we almost only did tie-ins um, and then because a lot of the buildings in New York were older and because there was uh, probably a, a circumstance of people electrocuting themselves they kind of uh, emigrated to uh, using generators with more frequency so um, so it's evolved over time now I think it's going back but I think the evaluation of a property is a is a one we always try and do that if we can tie in. It tends to be the bigger, newer buildings or something where they've had recent work where people feel more secure. Um, mm -hmm. But some places in New York where you just can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we always look to try and do it, but it used to be standard practice. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Well, outside of New York, <clears throat> I've had success pulling electricity from. Uh, uh, poles out on the street to mm -hmm. utilize. It's not something that I don't think right now New York City would be open to doing, but in smaller municipalities, I've been able to do it. Now, with the way that DOT works, with the only way that you can control street lighting in New York City is you go through the license uh, vendor for New York City with their permit to touch the lighting, like you have to do for night filming. Maybe there's a conversation to be had, you know, with the help of the mayor's office mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, can you hire that same type of vendor to pull electricity from the street to power things that normally would be done through generators on the street. But now if you can tap in right to a light pole or another source that's readily available in the city, certainly a better environmental practice if the city would allow such a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, obviously it will, it will vary in different places, but yeah, we've been successful. I mean, I've seen in other places, you know, with um, power drops, we've also seen, um, you know, in some places building those kind of tra temporary transformers. Um, so that is another thing. Um, and then, and something that we've seen here in Canada is, is um, they've been using these apps to actually, you um, kind of uh they they map where uh you know all these locations are and what their power needs are so when you go in you know a location manager or whatever look department will go in and they've got this map app and they just kind of put on there like where all the generators are and so what they've created is this kind of heat map of all the places where the power is you know most most required and um what what they're doing is a building film industry specific kiosks in those places that are only used by the film industry. They come along, they come with like parking, you know, and all kinds of different things that we have to consider when we have, you know, our big crew out there. Um, so we're starting to see this in Vancouver and also in Toronto. And I know they've been, you know, I know the mayor's office has talked to, to, to both of those offices about, you know, how they're doing that. So it's possible that, you know, one day we might be able to, to see that, but really just seeing, just identifying at the first step, like where where would this be, you know, most feasible, and then possibly tying it in with some um, infrastructure um, for EV charging, 
um, you know, things like that. Those are those are things that we're kind of hearing now from yeah. from other places. I mean, we need help from the cities and the governments uh, within them to build out the infrastructure to make the uh to make us have the ability to do better environmental practices um electric vehicles in new york city is a big thing it's i've heard some resistance of i'd love to get an electric vehicle but i live in a, an apartment i don't know where i'd charge it we don't really have a ton of resources with that in mind um so yeah i think some uh some help from the cities to improve their infrastructure for not only our industry but everyone that lives here to be able to do best practices would be a huge help mm -hmm. um yeah and i think that that's that's a great point um that you make damien because um also going into all these locations where we are filming and working with these com communities and municipal offices every Every municipality, every you know, everywhere we are, they all have climate action plans. So I, you know, I'm always thinking like, well, how can we align? I and mean, we're all trying to do the same thing and reduce, you know, our reliance on fossil fuels. So like, how can we work together? And I think you know, a lot of things can maybe, you know, be solved in 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 kind of collaboration with um, cities and and other offices. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of um, potential for really smart collaboration um, in, in everywhere, basically. <laughs> and there's a lot of business opportunity there too. I mean, you can set a business case and uh, you can have entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's something that um, we'll talk to um, Shira about in the past. And, um, you know, we, I always say like when, when the, when the, a, a film or a television set rolls in, we're like a traveling circus and we, you know, we, we need all these resources. We need, we need all the things that a city needs. So, uh, so we need the businesses to support um, a lot of the, the needs of a, of a crew because we're coming in as the traveling circus. So, you know, creating more opportunity for entrepreneurs and, and businesses in the city also, I think would you know, behoove the city to support that and, and, and individual um, mm -hmm. individuals, individual entrepreneurs. I also think um, another thing that that um, Shira has mentioned in the past is like, if we can have fewer vehicles out there idling or even just parked out on the streets, you know, and, and bring in these generators that are battery operated, this also brings down the noise. It's like all these cable, you know, all the all the all of the um, different elements that we bring in when we're setting our footprint, we can reduce some of that if we if we uh, have some of the infrastructure uh, yep. in terms of the uh, city. So it, yep. it can be, but that initial we have to do that initial um, uh, cost investment, and then we have to mm -hmm. you know let people know it's not just right now. So over time, we're going to see uh, cost savings and really benefits. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that establishing that infrastructure, maybe, you know, buy in from some of the studios that are operating in all these places, it just making it easier to be green. You know, I mean, it's it's really challenging to try to go in somewhere and they don't compost. I mean, we see this all the time. They don't compost, they don't have any, they don't have any services. So it's twice as hard for us to try to figure something out because it's not you know it's it's not provided for us there so building up these um you know supporting these uh, these these um companies these waste companies the you know building the infrastructure in all these places and i think like you're saying stephanie i think this is really it would you know, it could be a, a, a potential, um, you know, economic uh, impact because you're going somewhere knowing that you're going to be able to access, uh, you know, tie-ins or power drops and, and, and you know that you're going to be able to, you know, compose and source secondhand and, you know, have places that do de uh, deconstruction, demolition, all that is already there. So like, you know, going in and, and choosing that, you know, to be your, your place where you're going to work is, it just makes it easier. And, um, and we can see some cost savings as we've discussed. So, um, well, again, I just want to thank all of you so much um, uh, for joining us today. It's been so insightful and um, we really appreciate you sharing all of your, all of your um, experience with us. And um, again, please join us for November 9th, cost the, the Sustainable Costume Department um, office hours. And I think we have 
some resources to share um, on the you know New York City uh, Film Green uh, website as well as Earth Angel website. Um, I think we're putting them up here. I can't see my screen. Um, but again, thanks so much. And um, yes, we'll hope to see you all in November. And I just want to thank um, Shira and the mayor's office for hosting another uh, interesting office hours. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.